Hello. Today we will look at servicing some pneumatic format video recorders, particularly the Sony VO 9800, 9850 and similar machines such as 9600. Some pneumatic video recorders are now virtually worthless, but these models are still very useful for pneumatic tape playback, and so they can fetch a good price. They can play low band pneumatic tapes, high band and SP formula tapes. They have good connections, including dub signals, which can be useful for connecting to a time-based corrector, such as this one, and give you the very best possible picture quality that way. I don't take on repairs for other people, I have enough of my own equipment to service, but I was offered a deal which I just couldn't turn down. Two VO9800 machines would be sent to me, I'd get one working, return that to the owner, and get to keep the other one. Both are in good condition and lightly used, so let's get stuck in on them. Firstly, I would recommend replacing all three drive belts plus the real idler tyre. I will provide information below on suggested replacements for these. These won't be the original manufacturer's supplied spares, they are probably impossible to obtain now, but parts which I have found are perfect based just on their size. There is a small belt used in the cassette carriage drive, a slightly larger belt used in the lacing motor, this is the fiddliest to install, and a large belt which goes underneath the real drive motor. Finally, a tyre which goes onto the real idler assembly beneath the cassette carriage and between the tape spools. Firstly, let's take the lid off. Then we can remove the screws holding this spring loaded bracket over the top of the cassette carriage. This cassette carriage has got to be the easiest to work on of any video recorder I've ever seen. Once it is free to move, there is a multi-way connector to unplug on the right hand side. The whole carriage then simply lifts out. The drive belt sits on the right hand side and is easy to replace. If the old belt has snapped though, it will probably be lying around on the floor of the deck, so uh, you need to find and discard that. Next we want to replace the real idler tyre. There are two ways to do this. You can either do it in situ as I do it, uh, by pulling off the old tyre and carefully feeding on the new one. Or you can undo the small allen type grub screw on the side of the idler, lift it off and replace the tyre a little bit more easily, then refit. It's possible that the idler tyre has split and fallen off completely, in which case find it and discard it. Failure of the real drive will often give an error 02 on the display, either because this tyre needs replacement or the drive belt beneath. So let's do that drive belt uh, as the next one because it's very easy. First we'll refit the cassette carriage. We need to make sure the cables on the right hand side don't foul the space that the cassette enters. So give them a nudge to the right uh, to make sure that they're out of the way. We remove the bottom of the machine. This particular one has no feet installed because it's been used in a rack mount at some point. Once inside, there were two screws to remove at the edge of the PCB, and very importantly, one in the middle. You can then swing out this PCB out of the way to get really good access to the real drive motor and belt. Once I had a machine with intermittent error 02 displays and the loss of real drive, but at other times it ran perfectly. The problem turned out to be a dead segment on this uh, real motor. 
I didn't have a spare of exactly the same type, but I was able to install a similar motor from another model of uh, a scrap Umetic deck. Once we have finished reassembling the bottom, let's tackle the hardest belt, which is the lacing motor belt. Firstly, we access the deck by undoing the plastic clip on the top PCB and swinging it out of the way. Before I do anything here, I make sure that the two head drum tips are moved to the top and bottom of the deck, so we can't destroy one whilst working on motor assembly. There are two screws to undo um, on the lacing motor assembly. One of the tape end sensors is mounted on the top of this assembly, so be careful not to knock this when you lift the motor assembly out. then you can release the belt from the motor pulley but not yet from the worm drive pulley for this we need to take the plastic worm drive pulley out of the plastic housing there are two plastic clips on the top which are fairly easy to release and so remove the pulley there's also a small metal bracket to remove from the end that's furthest away from the belt Note the two black plastic washers on either end of the worm drive pulley. Don't lose these. Now let's get the old drive belt out of the way. New drive belt. Reassemble without losing the black plastic washers, which need to be against the body of the pulley when reinstalled. This is a bit fiddly. When reassembled, the pulley needs to spin freely. Then we need to feed the belt onto the motor pulley. Don't drop it onto the video drum. You can see why we move the head tips out of the way. Then reinstall the whole assembly, including the bracket over the pulley. When it comes to doing up the screws, there is some adjustment available on the back screw. Use this to make sure that the gear is fully against the loading ring, but not jammed too tight against it. Confirm manually by turning the motor that the loading ring starts to turn properly uh, before finally tightening up the screws. Now we can test the loading mechanism.
start with fast forward and rewind then play and finally eject all is working properly here next I want to show you a few general things about Umatic decks firstly have a look what happens when the deck is in rewind and gets close to the start of the tape bearing in mind of course that the supply spool is on the right side of this format the opposite way around to most video cassettes when it sees a clear leader tape arrive on the left hand optical sensor it stops rewinding and goes into fast forward for a few seconds but it is not very intelligent so if it sees light from the opto sensor all the time perhaps because the tape is damaged or it's not been grabbed properly by the tape guides it won't just stop after a few seconds it will keep trying and fast forwarding and fast forwarding in order to get past the leader tape if it fast forwards to the end of the tape so it sees light on the supply spool sensor which is on the right then the deck will just sit there going backwards and forwards for a few seconds at a time and will not respond to any jet command so if you get into the situation where a deck is just fast forwarding or shuttling between fast forward and rewind and will not respond and will not eject then you will need to cover the left hand opto sensor with something like a bit of tape in order to get the deck to respond again and eject the tape the deck has brakes next to the spools these have pads which are pushed against the spools when in stop mode to stop the spools from spinning on after a fast forward or rewind operation if these pads are worn away then a deck can spill tape out when it goes from fast forward or rewind to stop and this will damage the tape if you can't find new replacement pads you may be able to repair or fabricate new pad surfaces with some appropriate material I used a bit of masking tape glued onto the pads of one of my machines as a workaround since I had no spares and that machine has been running without any problems for years now so it was a good repair. My helper Scott will demonstrate the operation of the brakes. Okay Scott can you um, spin the right hand spool there with your finger? Doesn't turn very easily does it? No. Okay let me release the brake which is this part here. Now try again. Yeah that's a lot Spins easier. really easily doesn't it? Right. Yeah. And now uh, we'll do the same here. Um, I think we have two brakes I need to release here. So start with just that on its own. Just turn it. It barely moves. It barely moves. And now I think I've got to release two brakes on this one. That one. And that one. Try again. That's, that's extremely hard. Right, oh, one. yeah, that works. I've got it off. Right, okay. Yep. So the other brakes is this one here. And this one here. And that. And that one there. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've been working on the VO9800. I just wanted to show you a really useful feature on the very similar VO9850. There's a meter for the RF signal coming from the tape. This can be very helpful in diagnosing problems such as a weak tape signal. I've often had this with Scotch 3M branded tapes or if you have heads that are contaminated and need cleaning. There's a head hours meter built into these machines. You can access this from the menu option 205. Firstly though, I look at 207, which is a still frame timeout to see if that is still has a default setting of 15. If so, it is quite likely that the internal battery has failed, and so the hours meeting readings will be zero or meaningless. Here it is okay, but total machine hours on 206 and head hours on 205 look far too low for this machine. They're probably the hours I've put on this machine. Finally, a couple of other machines I wanted to show you. Here is this BVU850. This machine is a high band and SP compatible only, so if you attempt to play a low band pneumatic tape on here, then you'll get a monochrome picture. That seems like a bit of an oversight to me, but it's because it was intended for use in broadcast, where low band tapes really shouldn't have been used. Mechanically, it's very similar to, to the DMR4000 that you may have seen on my video about PCM digital audio recordings on pneumatic. Then I want to mention the VP9000. This is an NTSC high and low band player, which uh, I brought in from the USA. So this requires a 110 volt transformer. I bought it working in order for a job that I had, uh, which my multi-standard uh, VP7040 low band player can't handle. 
The job was urgent, but I'd been sold a pup. The machine didn't work at all. A clue was that the LED displays were blank, so it looked like a power supply problem. I didn't have a manual, and I couldn't find a problem with a power supply anyway. But checking the test points on a panel on the back left of the machine showed a 5 volt test point was very low. I pulled the board and traced the 5 volt supply back to a regulator and an ICP fuse. These are funny little things that look like transistors and they've got a very strange rating that is 40 times the number after the letter N in milliamps. This had gone resistive. Replacing it got the machine working and with a few hours of the faulty machine arriving I was running this urgent job. It's been a reliable machine ever since. The lacing mechanism is a bit noisy. Well, that's enough of Umatic video recorders for today. I hope you've gained something from this. And please do remember to like, share and especially subscribe. I will then do more audio and video technology content in the future. Bye for now.